Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, my name is Julie. I am the coordinator for the program Discover the Universe, and I'm very happy um, to be here, well, actually, to be online with you right now. I think this is going to be a great presentation um, about the discovery of gravitational waves, which we've probably heard about in the last month, um, actually about a month ago, when the detection was announced, it was a big news release, uh, press release, um, press conference, and it was all over the news, actually, even in the main media. Um, so before we get started with the talk, I just want to say a few words about Discover the Universe, in case you are new to our program. So Discover the Universe, I'm just going to wait for the <laughs> slide to appear. Actually, thanks for everyone who's online. Uh, um, it's great to see where you're all from. I see we have people from across the country and even from Europe actually joining us today. So this is great. Um, so Discover the Universe is an online training program for, ed for teachers and informal educators. So we offer webinars on various subjects like the one uh, you'll be watching today. We also have workshops spread over three weeks uh, for teachers and for informal educators. We just had one actually in February for teachers and the next one will be in June for informal educators. We're also developing different resources and activities. So our goal is really to help teachers and other educators um, share the wonders of astronomy with their groups. And we know sometimes people feel a little bit stressed about bringing up the subject because they might not have much, much knowledge about it. So we're here to help. And we offer our program everywhere in Canada. And actually now we have people from different countries also joining as well. Everything is done in French and English, and it's free. Actually, this web webinar is in English today. We'll have another guest speaker to offer a webinar about gravitational waves in French um, in the next few weeks, actually. And this program is offered by the Dunlap Institute from the University of Toronto, our new partner uh, this year, a new major partner, uh, as well as the Canadian Astronomical Society, and also by the two um, societies of amateur astronomers across the country. So I'm just going to come back. Um, oh, actually, no. I Just to, so you know our upcoming activities, our next webinar will be about the search for life in the universe. This should also be a very popular topic. It's on April 18th at 3 p.m. Nothing is on the website yet. I just want to update the website this week. Um, so you'll have the information on the website very soon. And if you, um, since you now have an account on Discover the Universe, you will also get the publicity and the information by email. We also have one about secrets of planet Mars on May 10th during the National Science and Technology Week. And we'll also have our workshop for informal educators spread over three weeks in June. So again, um, I don't think, and no, none of them are already posted on the website, but they will be very soon. I just wanted to mention them right now. So this is uh, the overview of Discover the Universe. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Heather Fong, who I believe will be giving us a very interesting talk. I saw the slides already, and uh, they seem great. So Heather is a PhD student at the University of Toronto uh, through the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And her specialty, actually, she specializes in gravitational waves, uh, general relativity, and cosmology, so the study of the universe as a whole. Uh, so she's really an expert on this topic. And she is part of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration Team. Um, and I checked, and actually her name is on the paper that was published on February 11th. So she's really the per best person to tell you about this discovery. And I see she's now online. So welcome, Heather. Is your microphone on, just to make sure we can hear you? Can I hear you? Hi, can everyone hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you perfectly well. That's awesome. Um, I'll turn my microphone in just a second. Now you can hear me through Heather's mic as well, but I'll just be hiding in the background. So if you have any questions during Heather's talk, feel free to type them in the chat. If she doesn't see them right away, we'll come back to them at the end, but I'll be there um, anyway to help. So thank you very much, Heather, and um, have a great talk. All right, thanks. Um, right, so thanks, uh, Julie, for the introduction. So I'm Heather. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto, and I'm one of the team members of LIGO, which is the experiment that detected the gravitational waves. So today I'll be talking to you about um, the discovery of gravitational waves that you've all been, you all might have heard about in the news recently, and why this discovery is music to Einstein's ears. Um, so for this talk, um, I'll be separating this. It's, I'm going to take on the theme of music as 
we go through this presentation. So my talk will be split up into different movements of, say, like a symphony. So first I'll talk about um, gravity, um, and then secondly, gravitational waves, what they are, how we can detect them. And then thirdly, I'll talk about the actual discovery itself. And finally, um, we'll conclude with, you know, what's next? What can we look forward to in the future? But first, let's talk about gravity. Uh, not quite this gravity, but the gravity that we might have learned uh, in high school, and some of us might actually be teaching in school as well. So gravity is really what is responsible for keeping us on the ground, as opposed to flying, in the, flying off into outer space like Sandra Bullock. And it gives us something called weight, where weight is, um, in physics, mass times gravitational acceleration where on Earth, gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. And it's also responsible for a lot of other things. So gravity is also what keeps Earth orbiting around the sun and our moon orbiting around Earth. And it's also gravity that gives us tides um, on Earth. On a much larger scale, you have um, gravity holding together the structure of solar systems and galaxies. And it's really what gives us this overall structure of our universe. Now, in the um, 1600s, Isaac Newton, he quote unquote discovered gravity when, the, when an apple fell on his head. And um, so, and actually, an interesting story is um, I originally am from Vancouver, so I did my undergrad at UBC. And next to UBC, there's this research facility called Triumph. And at the entrance of Triumph, there's this roundabout with a grassy area and lots of apple trees. And these apple trees are allegedly the descendants of the very apple that fell on Newton's head. <laughs> um, so Newton, when he was inspired by this falling apple, he developed his theory of gravitation, where he describes gravity as a force. Um, and it's dependent on the mass of the two objects and the distance away from e their distance from each other. And these two, ma these two objects are gravitationally attracted to one another. And gravity is, Newton's gravity is really quite successful. I mean, it's able to predict the prediction, of the motion of most planets, and it works for um, everyday situations here on Earth. And you know, that's why we teach it in school. With, using Newtonian gravity, we're able to um, predict the trajectory of balls that we throw up into the air or the trajectory of cannonballs that are shot off cliffs. However, uh, Newton's gravity fails, starts to fail or break down when objects are either moving very fast, very close to the speed of light, or they're in a very, very strong gravitational field. And one of the um, situations where Newtonian gravity doesn't quite work is it doesn't say describe Mercury's orbit. Now the image that's showing here, the orange sun, the orange the orange circle is the sun, and there's a smaller oh I can use the pointer. Okay. And there's a smaller brown dot with a white arrow around it each way. And um, so Mercury is the planet that orbits closest to the sun, and it orbits very, very quickly. And when it's noticed that when Mercury completes one orbit around the sun, it's offset by an angle. So when it completes the second orbit, its starting location is slightly different. And this continues on in this manner, and we call this um, a precessing orbit. So Mercury precesses around the sun. And Newton's gravity doesn't describe this motion. Um, so now enter 350 years later with general relativity. Um, Albert Einstein was the first to develop the sphere of general relativity in 1915. And the way he describes gravity is not as a, an external force, but something that just naturally arises due to the fact that our universe is curved. So it's attributed to the curvature of our universe. And in order to get a sense of what general relativity is, um, we first describe our universe as being four dimensions. 
Um, usually we describe our space as being three X, Y, and Z. And now we're going to add an additional dimension, which is time. And if you now imagine our universe being um, visualized as like a 2D surface, a rubber sheet. And it's a flat rubber sheet. If nothing's in it, it's going to be a flat rubber sheet. But now what we're going to do is we're going to populate our universe with objects that have mass, like planets, galaxies, and stars. And because these objects have mass, they're going to weigh down on this rubber sheet that we're using to describe the universe. So uni the universe is curved by things that have mass. And in the same way, matter also follows and it moves with that curvature of the universe. And the reason why general relativity is very successful is, it, for one, it agrees with Newtonian physics in weak gravity or, say, situations here on Earth. And it also is able to make a lot of other accurate predictions, such as um, it accurately predicts Mercury's precessing orbit. And it also um, provides us with a lot of other things that we use in present time, such as it makes things such as GPS possible. So just to give another um, picture of our, how general relativity works is, this is the same kind of idea where we have a rubber sheet and it's being bent or curved by these objects with mass. And so you have a picture of the sun here, as well as a picture of our, and the earth. And so the more massive your object is, the more intensely it's going to curve your universe. So um, your sun, because it's much heavier than the earth, it's bending the universe much more intensely. And you can then imagine your um, rubber sheet kind of almost looking like a funnel when there's a big sun in the center. It uh, funnels and it curves downwards. So as a result, when you have your sm much smaller Earth in the system, it kind of acts like if you were throwing a marble around the funnel. It's going to spiral around the Earth. It's going to spiral around the center of the funnel just in the same way that the Earth will now, spir now sp spirals around the sun. And the reason why um, the sun, the, the Earth hasn't orbit, hasn't spiraled right into the sun. Is just because um, there's very there's very little friction here in space. Um, so just to reiterate, Newtonian gravity, Newton Newton describes gravity as a force. So it's matter telling matter how to move. General relativity describes gravity as something that comes about because our universe is curved. So in this sense, matter tells your space how to curve. So you have your sun that's bending your space, bending your universe. And at the same time, you have space telling matter how to move. So because your universe is curved, your sun is going to orbit around the sun in a circular motion. And so the take home message really is for general relativity, um, gravity is not a force, but it's just attributed to the fact that our universe is curved in this unique way. Okay, so now how do gravitational waves fit into this? So gravitational waves, we describe them as ripples in the fabric of our space and time, in the fabric of our universe. So they're distortions. Um, imagine that now our universe is taking, this, taking the image of like a still pond, and if we threw a rock into the pond, the moment that it hits the moment that the, pond, the, the rock hits the surface of the pond, it's going to be creating these ripples that propagate outwards. And in the same sense, gravitational waves are these ripples that are distorting and disturbing our universe. And, um, so, and gravitational waves are, can be created by anything that has mass and acceleration. So right now, me just waving my arms here, I'm actually creating gravitational waves, and you can all do this too, although I can't see you from this, in this presentation. But an observable effect from gravitational waves is that they cause the objects, distance between objects to change. So um, just me waving my hands at my computer, I'm causing the distance between me and my laptop to change, to stretch and compress, and stretch and compress in very, very small amounts. And the larger your object, and the more massive it is, or the faster it's moving, the more powerful your gravitational waves are going to be. So for instance, um, this picture that is shown in the slide, there are 
these images of these two black holes that are orbiting around each other. And they're creating powerful gravitational waves. Now, black holes are very massive and very dense objects that were formed from um, dying stars. The explosions of dying stars are supernovae. And black holes are so massive that when light goes into a black hole, it can't come out. And so because they're so massive, and if they're moving very quickly, they're going to be generating very, very powerful gravitational waves. And these were predict predicted to exist in Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. And an important feature of gravitational waves is that they carry away energy as well. So because gravitational waves are, you know, waves, they have qualities that we're familiar with, such as amplitude, frequency, period, and wavelength, and things like that. And so um, right here is what a gravitational waves look like. And up here is the image of, say, like two black holes that are orbiting around each other. So when the two black holes are far apart and they're orbiting around each other, they're going relatively slow and so you get a gravitational wave that kind of just looks like a regular sine function. But as I mentioned before, gravitational waves carry away energy. So as they emit more and more gravitational waves, the system is going to lose energy and so these black holes are going to start orbiting closer and closer together. And because their orbits are getting smaller, their orbital period then decreases. And because of conservation of angular momentum, as the two black holes get closer together, they're also going to start um, speeding up and getting faster and faster. And so because of this um, behavior, the gravitational waves are going to increase in amplitude as well as frequency. And the gravitational wave field, the gravitational wave strength then increases until the two objects finally merge or they collide. And then once they become a single object, then the gravitational waves die off. So this is really describing what a gravitational wave looks like um, for, over the course of two black holes that are colliding with one another. And now we're pretty sure that gravitational waves exist um, because we, had, we have had direct evidence for them in the form of observing these two pulsating stars that were orbiting around each other. And this is a fairly famous system known as the Hulse-Taylor binary. And so this binary, this, these two pulsating stars um, were dis first discovered in the 1970s and they were um, observed for, for many decades. And what was discovered is that the orbital period of these two stars, they decrease at a rate that is perfectly predicted by general relativity. So there, these two stars were, in the, were observed to have their orbital period getting smaller and smaller. And let me just show you a plot that kind of demonstrates what's going on. So right here we have, um, if the two stars, their periods were remaining exactly the same, all for all time, you would get this straight line here. So there's zero orbital decay. The period just stays the same. They're at the same distance apart and they're just moving on in the same way forever and ever. However, what you can see from these uh, white data points is that their orbital period is in fact decreasing over the course of 40 years, which is what this plot um, shows. And this solid line that runs through all of these data points, it's not fitted to the data. It's actually just what is predicted by general relativity. And so this is really, this was an extraordinary revelation. Um, and it was, it really provided strong evidence that this, these two stars were losing energy in the form of gravitational waves. So it's that whole thing about how they're emitting gravitational waves, which causes their orbits to get smaller and smaller. And this was actually, this discovery was actually um, the recipient of the Nobel Prize back in 1993. So really what, let me just talk about what, what really causes gravitational waves. And basically everything can cause gravitational waves. Like I can make gravitational waves, we can all make gravitational waves, but we like to make gravitational waves that 
what are about, but we'd like to be able to detect gravitational waves. So we meet, need to find like very, very powerful sources of gravitational waves. And gravitational waves, we have to look for um, outside of our solar system, maybe within or outside our galaxy. So there's several sources of gravitational waves that are possibly detectable. Um, for instance, we have gravitational waves that are formed um, in the early universe, um, shortly after the Big Bang, when the universe was rapidly expanding. We also have um, gravitational waves emitted by very supermassive black holes that take place in the center of galaxies. And we also have gravitational waves emitted by, say, um, smaller black holes that are orbiting around each other and merging or very, very dense stars called neutron stars, which are doing the same thing. And so I'll mostly be focusing on this higher, this higher region of the spectrum in the gravitational waves, because this is what will be observed, what we'll be focusing on. Um, these sources from smaller black holes are what is detectable by detectors here on Earth. And so this brings me to talking about LIGO, uh, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It is an observatory that is, that is actually the one that made the first detection of gravitational waves. And it was first proposed in the 1970s, and so it's got like a 40, over 40 years of history with it. So LIGO is made up of two identical detectors. One is in Washington, and the other one is in Louisiana. Both are in the United States. And they're identical in the way of their structure. Um, they're both, they both made it, are made of these L shapes with these two perpendicular arms, which are four kilometers in length. And um, so let me, so right here is a movie that will demonstrate to you um, how LIGO is actually able to make um, very precise distance. These, changes in distance due to gravitational waves. And so I think Julie is going to show that. Right, so how it works in one of the detectors is that you shoot a laser and it gets split into two and they both race down the arms. Then they get reflected off those mirrors at either end of the arms and they come back into the center and, recom and recombine with one another. And because those two arms are identical in length, when the two laser beams come back together, they're going to destructively interfere. So the two light waves are going to add up together and we're going to get zero signal coming through our detectors. And so um, then we can move on to the next part of the movie. So that works. So you get zero signal when, there's, um, when the two arms are identical in length. But as I mentioned before, gravitational waves change the distance between objects. So when a gravitational wave passes through the detector, they're going to cause those arms to change in very, very small amounts. As a result, when the two laser beams travel through the arms and come back, they're not going to perfectly destructively interfere anymore. Instead, we're going to get this non-zero intensity that comes through our detectors, and so we're able to make that measurement that the distance between the arms has changed, and it's really the smoking gun that tells us that we've seen gravitational waves. And yeah, so going back to the presentation now. So as I mentioned before, um, the gravitational waves are emitted by very, very powerful, the gravitational waves we can detect are emitted by very, very powerful sources, such as these like black holes that are orbiting around each other. And when you're right next to those black holes, it's very, very tumultuous. It's like a storm. Um, you have these powerful black holes and they're just distorting space time and it's just cataclysmic, these wave, gravitational waves that are emitted. But by the time these gravitational waves get all the way down to Earth, where we are, they've pretty much, they've died off a lot in strength. And really how much have they died off? Um, 
So the peak amplitude expected from gravitational waves from these colliding black holes is one part in 10 to the 21. That means that the change in distance that gravitational waves will cause is one part in 10 to the 21. And to give you an idea of really um, how sensitive LIGO has to be, so LIGO has their arms, they're each four kilometers in length. And so gravitational waves passing through LIGO will change those arms by one one thousandth the size of a proton, which is incredibly, incredibly small. And this is really the reason why it's taken over 40 years for LIGO to be able to get where it is today, because such a thing was pretty much impossible when it was first proposed. And this is really made possible by um, extraordinary feats in engineering and technology. So here are some images that are demonstrate the LIGO's instruments. Um, in the top right, so in, the in this top right hand picture here, you have one of the mirrors that is situated at either end of the arms. And this mirror has been polished to extreme precision, to the precision of a human hair, and just to make it as reflective as possible for the laser, to keep as much of the laser light back into, reflecting back into the arms. And this laser is um, sealed. All the arms are vacuum sealed, so there's no air that gets in. And the mirror is suspended by this very sophisticated pendulum system, um, which is what is being shown in the bottom right-hand plot. And this very sophisticated, it's suspended by the pendulum system in order to isolate away the noises due to seismic activities such as earthquakes or even falling trees. And finally, this here, the left-hand plot, shows you LIGO's laser system. So it's made up of several components and when and it actually be, is about 800 times more sense, 800 times more powerful than what you could buy than the laser pointers you can buy just off the shelf. So really, a lot of a lot of technology went and a lot of work went into making LIGO really the most precise instrument in the world. Now, LIGO, the LIGO whole LIGO collaboration itself is uh, very very large. It's made up of about a thousand researchers spanning 15 different countries, and all of, the, all of the different institutions are pointed out on this map. And the yellow arrow indicates where, um, indicates Toronto, where CETA is, which is, CETA is the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. It's at the University of Toronto, and it's the only Canadian institute that is involved with LIGO research. And um, that's actually really the reason why I decided to do grad studies in Toronto, because uh, University of Toronto is the only place that has active research in gravitational waves and detecting them. Um, OK, so this here is a poster of Interstellar, which is a movie that talks about black holes. But that's not the only reason why I put it up here, because um, the executive producer and scientific consultant for Interstellar is actually a member of LIGO. Um, his name is Kip Thorne, and he's actually one of the co-founders of LIGO. He's one of the first to propose the um, propose building the instrument back in the 1970s. I thought it was just a cool fun fact. But now let's finally talk about the discovery. So the actual, we actually were able to discover gravitational waves 40 years after LIGO was proposed, after a really long history. Um, we detected gravitational waves on September 14th, 2015, very, very early in the morning. And not only did we detect gravitational waves, we were able to determine that they were emitted by two black holes. Um, one of them is 29 and 36 times the mass of the sun. And these two black holes were orbiting around each other, and then they collided to form a single black hole that has a mass of 62, time, 62 times the mass of the sun. And, and um, in case you were wondering what this, let's see. Yes, so this here shows the actual size of the final black hole. And you can see that 
Um, it's really about the size of maybe Iceland or Ireland, but that weighs 62 times the mass of the sun. So this is what I mean when I say black holes are the densest, ma most massive objects in our universe. And so um, when you look at these, when you, when, if you were doing some mental arithmetic with the two black holes, 29 plus 36 doesn't add up to 62. It adds up to 65. And that extra mass that was lost was emitted in the form of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves emitted three suns worth of energy, which is absolutely incredible amount of energy. And that energy is really enough to power all of the stars. The energy is really um, enough to power all the stars and all the, all the stars in our galaxies for 500 years. And so this event we call GW150914, which stands for Gravitational Waves Found 2015, September 14th. And so right now, um, Julie is going to help me play the simulation of what these collision, what this collision looks like. Um, so this is what the black hole collision would have looked like if we were up in space watching it. And this has been slowed down so that we can see the collision clearly. And you can see that these two black holes, that they're orbiting around each other, they're so dense that they're actually distorting the light of the stars behind them. So that's that strange, weird effect that you're seeing right there. Um, so as they orbit around each other, they're emitting gravitational waves, losing energy. They get closer and closer together, and they speed up until finally they become that one single black hole, the one that weighs 62 times the mass of the sun. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Heather. I don't know if the video is playing well for you. It's very slow over here, but um, it's coming. <laughs> oh, I was I was able to see. I'm not sure if um, how clear it was for other people though. I'll just leave it for a few more seconds to finish here because the recording. I don't know exactly. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's just me. Then I'm glad it was working for everybody else. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Actually, Heather, while we're just, I'm just going to leave. Okay, perfect. It just ended here because I want to make sure the recording is fine. There were two questions um, that I didn't answer in the chat. Okay. I don't know if you can see them or if you want to come back to them at the end. The video is over now, so you decide. Um, sure, I can address some questions now. Um, is it, One of the questions is why the concept of gravity is in 2D. Yes, there was that right. one. I gave a quick answer, and then there were two other ones. After. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, just to address the concept of gravity in 2D, I mean, Julie pretty much covered it. Um, it's just really um, it's just really easy. It's much easier for us to visualize um, in describing the curvature of our universe because um, we're describing 2D, a 2D thing with, like, a third dimension because of the curvature, but we're not able to visualize four dimensions. We're not able to um, visualize four dimensions or five dimensions. So that's why we use the rubber sheet as a, an example. Um, and so the next question is, what is the media that spreads the gravitational waves? Is Tesla right to say that universe is filled with ether? So gravitational waves are formed from objects that have mass and they're accelerating, such as these um, two black holes that are orbiting around one another. Um, and so they're pro they, propagate, they, they, they propagate through our universe and it's not so much, in, it's not really, an, it's not an ether, it's just that they're distorted, they're causing distortions in um, our universe because of this, because of these gravitational waves. And, okay, I think, do we know the amplitude of gravitational waves when they're generated? Um, so that question is, I guess, answered. And 
Can gravitational waves cause gravitational waves cause earthquakes? Um, gravitational waves will cause the shape and size of the Earth to change by very, very small increments. But I don't think that they could be called earthquakes because they're not generated. The ones that we can observe, they're not generated from Earth, um, if that makes sense. I hope that answers. Um, so another question, will the data enable the determination of elasticity of space-time? Um, I'm not sure I understand what the question is. Elasticity of space and time. Um, space time is definitely curving and distorting due to these gravitational waves, due to um, planets and stars and galaxies in our universe. Um, and the data really just shows you that it's the, shows you how the how distances are being distorted. So not so much maybe the elasticity or the intrinsic value, the intrinsic parameters of space-time. Um, and the last question, I think, and then I'll move on. Did we detect these waves because they were the only ones being generated, or did we just happen to be properly oriented to detect these? And the answer is the second one. And we, the second one, we just happened to be properly oriented to detect these, we were sensitive enough, and we were just basically in the right place at the right time. Okay. And so, um, right, so what we just saw was an animation of the two black holes colliding and merging to become one black hole. And that's what it would look like if we were in space. But we're not in space, so we're in Earth. Earth and, and what LIGO sees is, again, that relative change in distance that or, or that one part in 10 to the 21 change in distance that I was talking about before and this is what comes out of line is the data and the yellow line is the prediction from general relativity and you can see that the you can see the shape of the gravitational waves it starts off um, at a lower frequency and then it increases in strength until finally it peaks and then the gravitational waves die off and the fact that these two lines, the prediction and the observed data, they lie right on top of each other is an excellent indication that um, this gravitational wave was seen. And this data was taken from the detector in Washington. Now let's look at the data that um, was found in Louisiana, the second detector. And we find that, yes, Louisiana detector also saw gravitational waves. And the blue is, again, the observed data, and the light blue is the predictions from general relativity. And again, these two lie right on top of each other. And finally, if we combine the data from both detectors, we see that they, again, also lie right on top of each other. So it means that not only did both detectors see gravitational waves, they saw gravitational waves emitted by the same source, which is very, very conclusive evidence for a positive, real detection of gravitational waves outside our solar system. And when you look at these lines, these wiggly lines, they kind of look like sound waves. And so what we decided to do was, we can, what we can do is we can convert these, these um, waveforms, these lines, into an audio clip so that we can actually listen to what it sounds like when two black holes actually collide. And that will be what um, will be played shortly. So before this, we play this video clip for you, you're going to hear two different sounds. One is going to be kind of a low rumbling sound, like a heartbeat. And then the second one is going to be much higher pitch. So the low rumbling sound is the original frequency of these gravitational waves. And then the higher frequency, we just increased it so that it's more audible to our human ears. And this will 
play and it'll repeat itself a few times. So really try and listen for the... So I, was everybody able to hear that okay? Yeah, okay, awesome, right. So you heard that thumping sound. It sounds almost like a heartbeat. And then the much higher one where we in just increase the frequency to make it more audible. And when you think about, you're thinking about what is ha happening, you have these two black holes that are 30 times the mass of the sun. They're orbiting around each other at insane amounts of speed, going close to the speed of light. And then they finally um, merged and collide to form a single black hole that's 60 times the mass of the sun. And in doing so, they emit like three solar masses worth of energy. So it's this incredible dramatic event. And all of that is con all of that information is contained in that little whoop sound that you heard just now. And so, which is kind of underwhelming, it might be a bit underwhelming, but I don't know. I really like that sound because it just shows that nature has a sense of humor. <laughs> and so another thing that we can detect, um, we can determine from these two black holes that were merging is where they actually occurred in our universe or in our sky. And so right here, what's being shown is a map of our night sky. This blurry image, this blurry line that runs through the center is our Milky Way. And this rainbow region is where we expect these two um, black hole mergers would have occurred. And we determined that the two black holes, they merged 1.3 billion light years away from us. So well outside our galaxy, but very, very far away. And they also, we are also able to determine in the same sense that they, these actually occurred 1.3 billion years in the past. So what you can really actually say is these two black holes merged a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So, um, you know, who knows? Who knows what Darth Vader was up to at that moment? So really, what's next for this? Um, what's next? What comes after this detection? Like, why, what, do, what do we look for? What can we look forward to? Well, LIGO is going to be continuing to take, take observational data, um, not, and it's really going to start um, later on this year, and it's going to continue for several years. And as it takes um, over the next few years, LIGO is going to be more and more sensitive. And we expect to make more and more detections as the years go on. And LIGO is not going to be alone. In the next coming months, next coming years, a lot more gravitational wave detectors are going to be joining us. There's one in uh, Italy, Japan, and India. And the more gravitational waves we get, the more we're better to, say, pinpoint the location where we see those black hole mergers or those black hole collisions. And we also increase, get an increase in sensitivity as well. And so in the past, most of our astronomy has been done by observing light or using electromagnetic waves from all, of through, all throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's how we've been mapping our universe. And, every, and we've been able to um, discover quite a lot. Um, first, we observe, of course, in the visible wavelength. And then we've also made a lot of, but then we also moved on from the visible wavelength. And we started being able to look at the universe in, for instance, radio waves and gamma rays. And every time we make these amazing new leaps in the way we observe our universe, we Enhance our, dis enhance our understanding of the universe. So for instance, just by observing radio waves, we were able to create a, a photograph of our universe when it was very, very young, when it was just a baby, um, just 400,000 years after it was first formed. Now, we want to be able to do the same thing. We want to map our universe using gravitational waves, which is completely separate from light. It's completely separate from electromagnetic waves. And this is the same um, 
image that I showed before, but it shows you the different sources that we have that are generated by gravitational waves. And we can make a lot of new discoveries just by observing this entire new, observing the universe using this entirely new method. And so, and every time we make, um, we try and probe different areas of gravitational waves, we're going to be have, using different detectors. So right now we are at this point in the Earth-based laser interferometers or Earth-based detectors. And then in order to say observe gravitational waves coming from even more massive black holes, we'll have to take those detectors and throw them into space so that we no longer have to worry about um, noise due to Earth effects. And you have more and more different detectors that can probe different types of gravitational waves. And so this is uh, really what we have to look forward in the future, being able to map our universe in gravitational waves. So, I mean, in 1916, Albert Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves, a year after he first presented his theory of general relativity. And 100 years, we finally found them. We finally were able to make this detection. And in doing so, we've found an entirely new way to observe our universe, an entirely new way to do astronomy. So it's really we're at, what we're at right now is 400 years ago when Galileo pointed the first astronomical telescope into the sky and he was able to observe the moons of Jupiter. And now we're at that exact same point where we've just opened our LIGO detectors and we were able to, for the first time, hear the collision of two black holes merging. And at the beginning of the talk, I showed this um, quote, music in the soul can be heard by the universe. And I mean, I'm, I know this quote has a much deeper meaning, but if we were to take this quote literally, it means that the universe can hear us. Well, now we can hear the universe and we know that it's playing us a symphony of music. So this is the end, pretty much the end of my talk, but here are some additional resources that I've included in case you wanted to learn more. So the first link is the official LIGO scientific collaboration website. It has a lot of great pictures, a lot of resources, um, and more information about how um, LIGO works. And um, some other links also, I've also included that have include like classroom activities or other educational resources in case you wanted to say talk about this with your classes. And some other links I put up for fun because you can actually play with real gravitational wave data, which is always fun. And that's it for me. Thanks very much. Hi. Um, well, thank you, Heather. This has been a very very sorry there's some delay when i hear myself it's kind of weird it's a very interesting talk so thank you very much and this was not a topic that's super easy to make accessible for everyone but i think everyone here will agree that it was very well done um i think there were a few questions that we missed along the way and i really invite everyone to write their questions right now if you want because we have a few more minutes um yeah sure. uh, if you want to ask um, the expert this is your chance so while we're waiting for more people to, to uh, type, maybe you could just scroll back up. I'll let you read them because it's very weird for me to hear myself with the echo. But if you just scroll back up, there were a few, um, I think. Um, let's see. Right. So I think the last question, the, the first question that I haven't answered is, um, does the offset in the waves from the two sources give us direction? Uh, so I'll answer that one first. So um, not so much the offset in the waves from the two sources, but the, off the reason why we're able to get um, a general direction is because there's a time delay from where um, gravitational waves reach um, the Washington detector and when the gravitational waves, the same gravitational waves reach the Louisiana detector. So gravitational waves, they travel at the speed of light. And um, there's enough of a delay between um, 
living or Louisiana and the Hanford detector that um, the gravitational waves arrived at the Louisiana detector about seven milliseconds before the Washington one. And so using that information, um, the detectors kind of function like ears. And so we're able to kind of um, find, look, kind of direct our, deten our attention to where those, the location of those two black holes. Um, so what would generate gravitational waves in the early universe? Um, so what gravitational waves can be, for instance, created by these very, very small, these quantum fluctuations um, when the universe was first formed. And one of the big um, sources of, of gravitational waves are those that were caused when the universe was rapidly expanding shortly after the Big Bang. So we call that inflation. Um, they were, the universe went through a period when it was expanding like exponentially large, and it's these sudden, this sudden expansion that uh, generate, is believed to have generated um, gravitational waves. And this was actually um, what, a cert, what an experiment called BICEP2 back in 2014. They thought they saw these waves um, by observing, the, observing um, light coming from the early universe. Um, but I think they're still searching for, they're still searching for them right now. Um, okay, and then there's another question. Will the space-based systems have a third axis? Okay, so I'm thinking that you're talking about state, the, the gravitational wave detectors that we want to go, we want to put up in space. Um, there's actually one in development which is called, um, which is headed by the European Space Agency. It's called LISA. It stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And it actually looks very, very similar to LIGO. Um, it doesn't have a third axis, but it has like a central, a central station. And there's two smaller, stage, two smaller stations on either end. So it's still in that same L shape. But, the re but these, um, the, what makes LISA different is that they are, um, there are no arms built. They're just basically, they just, they're just very, very precisely fixed and they're just in free fall with one another. So they're just separated without any um, separate arms. And the distance between these two, these smaller stations from the main one is the order of millions of kilometers. So there's a much, much more massive scale than LIGO, which makes it also more sensitive to different um, gravitational wave sources. So I'm just scrolling down to look at some more. <laughs> yeah, so there were over like a thousand authors in that paper. <laughs> um, and also some who were um, who have passed away, but they were also really, really important in the early development of LIGO, and so we honored them in the paper as well. Okay, um, now that you have detected these gravitational waves, does it make it possible to transfer Einstein's Nobel for the photoelectric effect to his theory of general relativity. <laughs> I think maybe he should get two Nobel Prizes. I mean, one for the photoelectric effect, and now this one for his theory of general relativity. <laughs> and those waves travel faster than the speed of light. So um, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, not faster, not less, but at the speed of light. And this is just found from working through um, the equations of general relativity. And so we're able to um, determine their speed just from um, solving for his, for his equations in general relativity. Oh, those generated from the Big Bang. Uh, yes, so they should also still travel at the same speed, at the speed of light. And what is the impact of gravitational waves on Earth? So, yeah, so um, the impact of gravitational waves on Earth. Um, so I guess maybe if you are interested, the gravitational waves that we can 
we can make on Earth. So um, remember, when I talked about gravitational waves form caused by these two binary black, these two black holes that are orbiting around each other, they change the distance here on Earth. Their effect is one part in 10 to the minus 21. Now, if we were just here on Earth and we were trying to make our own gravitational waves, the effect would be much, much, much smaller. So just me just waving my arms in the air, the amount I'm actually changing the distance between me and my laptop just by waving my arms is one part in 10 to the 56. So it's 25 orders of magnitude smaller than anything, than anything that comes from um, black holes. That's why we're not able to make detections from gravitational waves made here on Earth. And that's why we have to look to um, massive objects outside our solar system in order to detect for gravitational waves. Um, does the super string theory apply here? Um, I don't know too much about super string theory um, or string theory at all, unfortunately. Um, so I can't really comment on that. <laughs> Sorry. Heather, I guess just the fact that you don't work with string theory, so I guess that means there's completely two separate things. Like when you study gravitational waves, you're not into the string theory at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I guess that answer. I guess that answers the question. <laughs> Maybe in a way. <laughs> <laughs> These were great questions, everyone. So again, if you have one last one, this is your chance to ask. To ask. Um, while while you do that, I just want to thank Heather again for such a great talk. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope you have a lot of su success with. First of all, finishing your PhD <laughs> and then continue on with your uh, studies. This is a very, very interesting field. And it's amazing to learn about the science behind it, but also the technology and how actually humans are able to create detectors for such weak signals. I find that completely fascinating. Me too. It just blows my mind every time I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I see a few people are writing, so we'll give them a minute to finish typing. But I see thank yous. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, everyone, yes, for attending and for, um, I know many people will be watching the recording, so thank you for watching till the end. And again, you are invited to come back to other presentations that will be offered through Discover the Universe. So I think, Heather, the last question is for you here. <laughs> okay. All right. What will I do after I complete my PhD? That is an amazing question. Some, that is a question I ask myself every day, to be honest. Um, after I'd finished my PhD, I'd really like to get a job somewhere in Canada, maybe continuing on in this research. So as I mentioned before, Toronto's really the only place that does gravitational wave research in Canada. And it'd be really nice that maybe following this discovery, um, maybe more institutes would be, more Canadian institutes would be interested in this field now. And I think that, um, for instance, I'm originally from Vancouver, and I think my mom would be really happy if I came back and came back to Vancouver and worked there. <laughs> I was going to say bye, but I see there's another question or something else anyway. Yeah, so there's the, que there's the question of scale, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, well, like just really quickly, another, if it's, sometimes it's difficult to imagine, like four kilometer long arms changing by, changing by like one one thousandth the size of a proton. And really another, in proportion to that, you can imagine the distance from Earth to our nearest star is about four light years away. And so one part in 10 to the 21 of four, Four light, a four light year distance means um, that gravitational waves would be changing that distance by the width of a human hair. That's, that's, an, that's another way to visualize how extraordinarily precise LIGO is. <laughs> yeah, quite amazing. 
Okay, well, I think that's it. I think some people are going right now, actually. So thank you very much to, first of all, our guest speaker, Heather. That was a great talk. So thank you for accepting my invitation. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everyone for listening. <laughs> Bye now.